Hello everyone. Welcome to today's session of the course History of English Language and Literature. In today's lecture, we begin looking at a new era in literature, the Jacobian age and this also marks the end of the Elizabethan period. Let's begin with this lecture by taking stock of the Elizabethan age and taking a look at how things were looking like in England towards the end of the Elizabethan period. Many historians at a later point have wondered whether the epithet the golden age was more like a hyperbole and less of a reality. Though we have seen that in terms of literature it was indeed a golden period. Uh, the Elizabethan age did see the flourishing of many genres and also saw the emergence of particular kinds of writing and uh, writers such as Shakespeare and many other stalwarts. But at the same time for certain other communities and certain other groups of people this was not so golden an age. Uh, in fact many historians have noted that England did not have many golden practices in place when it came to dealing with especially the black community who had begun to arrive in Elizabethan uh, England from the 16th century onwards and also the uh, treatment of the Irish were not so commendable. The political tussle with Ireland and the treatment of the Irish is something that we will time and again come back to when we later look at the Celtic revival as well. And also England being a Protestant nation it did not uh, treat the Catholics very kindly either. Later we will see how the uh, Puritans were they continued to remain as a discontented lot under the reign of the Elizabethan even in the uh, succeeding uh, period. Nevertheless, this period is of supreme importance and many historians including Trevelyan have noted that in spite of the difficulties and in spite of the challenges that the Elizabethan period posed, it did uh, show England a new way in which it could go ahead. And in that sense, compared to the other neighboring uh, states and compared to the uh, other major economies and other major, major political forces in uh, uh, the rest of Europe. England had ceased to be the anvil and it became the hammer. So this is how we look at the Elizabethan age uh, from a hindsight. So it is very difficult to ignore this period in spite of the many challenges and the many limitations that the uh, period and the epithet golden age uh, post. There is another pressing question that comes to our mind when we talk about the Elizabethan period and also about renaissance in general. Where are the women during this period? We hardly hear about any noted women writers or any noted uh, uh, women artists of this period. We also know that women were not permitted on stage even when theatre was the most uh, uh, important uh, form of dramatic uh, entertainment, even when theatre was the most important form of entertainment during the Elizabethan period. So this is a question that uh, has been troubling the historians and uh, uh, many other critics for a very long time and some recent uh, research has already been done on uh, the women writers during the renaissance period. We shall be coming back to this at a later point when we are done looking at the English renaissance uh, uh, in, in general. Uh, but uh, taking a look at what whether the women actually had a renaissance or not during that period, it is important to note that during the renaissance period they lose even the little economic power that uh, women uh, had during the medieval ages. And though they, are, they uh, briefly gain uh, some status and also gain a lot of opportunities for education, we do not uh, find them coming into the public sphere. They were largely uh, sheltered within their own families and uh, they were kept away from these predominantly male worlds of writing, commerce and government. So there is hardly any documented presence which uh, the historians talk about. And also though England was ruled by a female monarch during this time we do not see the status of women changing drastically. In fact uh, with the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth we find that this uh, uh, status is even uh, uh, the status com comes down even uh, further and women's general status gets hampered and their intellectual aspirations are uh, no longer credible. And with James the first who uh, is considered to be a notorious misogynist. Uh, things do not get any better at all and in fact there is this anecdote about James the first that he remarked about this particular erudite woman who names uh, remains unknown uh, that after hearing about her scholarship and her uh, brilliant wit James the first is said to have remarked but can she spin. So this is a kind of uh, status and the kind of uh, attitude that uh, you know, people generally had towards uh, uh, the women in spite of the uh, spirit of the renaissance and the spirit of the reformation which provided and promised a, a freer and a, a secular kind of uh, uh, ambience all around. So when we look at the end of the Elizabethan era, when we look at the end of the Elizabethan era, we uh, begin to note that 
Uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, final years were not so comfortable. It was uh, shrouded in a lot of uh, political uncertainty and many of her councillors were also very unhappy that she had not yet named a successor and that England they feared had uh, was about to fall into some kind of a civil war due to this uh, uh, uncertainty. And Elizabeth I eventually uh, dies on 24th March 1603 and she had not yet made any explicit provision for a successor. But nevertheless, uh, the, all the, uh, everyone uh, had assumed that James VI of Scotland, who was the nearest living royal relative of Elizabeth, could be a possible successor to the English throne. But this uh, possibility was also fraught uh, with a lot of challenges. And before we move on to look at what kind of challenges and how the succession came into place, it's important to see who exactly James VI uh, was in terms of the uh, royal genealogy. So here we begin locating the genealogy of uh, uh, James the Sixth of Scotland, James the First of England. And uh, if you look, go back a little bit in history. There's this King Henry the Seventh, whose son was Henry the Eighth, who assumes power and who was quite uh, uh, spectacularly important in the history of uh, England. He is the one who breaks away from the Roman Church and forms the Church of uh, England and it is uh, from Henry the uh, Eighth that uh, Elizabeth first descends and takes over as the, as the Queen of uh, England and this is what happens uh, on the English side. And on the other hand there was this other daughter that Henry the Seventh had Margaret Tudor who gets married to James the Fourth of Scotland and this is how Scotland comes into the uh, picture and James the Fourth belonged to the House of Stuart. And if you remember, Henry VIII belonged to the house of Tudors. And James V succeeds James the Fourth, and he becomes the king of uh, Scotland. And Mary the First happens to be the wife of James the Fifth, and who takes over as the queen of uh, uh, Scotland after the death of James the Fifth. But this time also pro proves to be quite turbulent and she eventually dies in 1587. She is in fact executed by Queen Elizabeth and some of the details of which we have already noted uh, in the previous sessions. And but what is important for us uh, is the understanding that James the sixth of Scotland, uh, the son of Mary the first who was executed by Queen Elizabeth, he was born on 1566 but he assumes the, uh, assumes the status of king in 1567 in less than a year after he was born. And he continues to be the king of Scotland uh, till the end of his life. And also we find that he being the only relative, uh, royal relative of Elizabeth I, he gets to rule over England as the next successor of uh, Elizabeth I. So here we find that after Elizabeth I, we have James the sixth of uh, Scotland assuming the crown of England as James the I. So he holds two titles during his lifetime, James the I of England and James the sixth of Scotland. And also we find that around this time the unification of both these uh, uh, crowns take place because it is the same person who is ruling over England and uh, Scotland. So this is a genealogy of uh, James the first which also uh, leaves us with this understanding that even though Elizabeth had not mentioned or specified a particular heir, he was the most legitimate and the, uh, the immediate uh, relative who, was, uh, who had uh, all the kinds of rights to succeed her as the uh, next king. So coming back to our main topic, what were the major challenges that James the uh, sixth of Scotland faced before he was crowned as James the first of England? The challenges were mostly legal in nature and there were a lot of these uh, statutes and edicts that the English parliament had brought about in order to bring about uh, political stability in England. And in 1351, there was this particular edict which uh, forbade all foreigners to inherit English lands. And technically, though James VI of Scotland was a relative of uh, uh, Elizabeth I, he was a foreigner. He was a Scottish uh, uh, because his father was Scottish. So this technically forbade him to inherit uh, uh, the crown of uh, England. And in 1544, the parliament had come up with another statute, um, uh, uh, for it, it was called the parliamentary succession statute and this in fact had ordered that a, every living uh, monarch should uh, uh, name a successor in order to ensure a smooth kind of a succession. And in the event that any queen or uh, king failed to name a successor, 
it uh, was uh, considered quite a uh, critical stage. And in fact, England was facing such a period after the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth because she had failed to mention any successor and uh, therefore, it was a little difficult to hand over the uh, crown legitimately to uh, to uh, James the sixth of Scotland because there were these legal uh, issues. And in 1547, uh, Henry VIII had uh, come up with this will which stated that the Scottish relatives, his Scottish relatives could not inherit the throne at any point and this was done deliberately as a political strategy because uh, he knew that Margaret Tudor and her successors could eventually pose a threat to his own uh, uh, his own uh, throne and he had made the, made up this will in order to completely uh, outdo all the possibility of any of Margaret Tudor's successors coming to power in England. And in 1585, there was uh, another statute that the parliament had uh, um, put forward which argued that if any claimants should conspire against Queen Elizabeth, their legal rights were to be fortified. This was uh, the uh, this was in light of the major political challenges and even the many uh, the, the many death threats that Queen Elizabeth faced during her lifetime, and the Parliament had uh, f uh, was forced to come up with this thing in order to uh, completely eliminate the claims of all the other royal relatives who were conspiring against her, and also the uh, the kind of support also to counter the kind of support that uh, uh, Catholic Church was offering to any other legal possible heir that Queen Elizabeth had. So, James VI of Scotland had to overcome all of these difficulties if he had to become James I of England. And how did he overcome and how did he ensure a smooth succession? It is in this context that we know the role of uh, Robert Cecil. Robert Cecil was a Secretary of State and he was a very well known administrator and a renowned politician. He was also a Privy Councillor in Elizabeth's, uh, Queen Elizabeth's court and he is the one who is said to have engineered James I's succession and uh, managed a major succession crisis in England in the early 17th century. Uh, even before James uh, of, even before James VI of Scotland had assumed uh, the crown of England. Robert Cecil had identified a, a potential uh, king in him and he had begun to uh, manage the affairs in England accordingly. He had even before uh, James I became the king, he had organized the publication of his uh, Basilicon uh, Doron which was an advice on kingship that James I had written uh, addressing his uh, son. And uh, it, it generally said in history that James I was made king by prior arrangement. And because uh, Robert Cecil had played a major role in politically and strategically placing uh, King uh, James the first succession as a uh, very legitimate and legal thing to do. And he was declared king by Robert Cecil in the parliament also and this is the phrase uh, incidentally that he had used. Uh, he was declared king by law, by linear succession and undoubted right. So, this in fact uh, brings into light the various uh, ways in which uh, kings and queens succeeded in a, to the English throne and it was not always uh, uh, possible just through uh, ensuring a legitimate right through kinship, but it was also important to have a political ally in place in order to ensure a smooth succession and even to remain on power, uh, even to remain in power throughout. And what were the advantages of King James I when he assumed the throne of uh, when he assumed the throne of uh, England? He was a proven monarch. As we noted earlier, he becomes king, the King of Scotland, at a very young age, as early as uh, a few months old. He was barely a year old when he became the King of Scotland. He began ruling more or less uh, on his own uh, right from the time he was uh, from, from the time he reached the age of twelve. He was ably assisted by many of the other courtiers and many other council members, but nevertheless he knew the ways of the world and he knew how to uh, rule a kingdom right from a very young age. And he himself introduced, he introduced himself in the English parliament uh, as an old and experienced king. And uh, this was also, uh, there, there was also this thing about his rising reputation in uh, Europe. He was a good political strategist and he had very good relationships with many of the monarchs uh, in Europe and in fact as soon as he assumes the throne of uh, England we find him uh, quite uh, tactfully ending the war with Spain and establishing peace over there and uh, the, oh, due to these many things he had enjoyed a very good reputation among the neighboring uh, city states. And 
also the english people were quite relieved that they got a male monarch after the 40 year reign of the virgin queen they were also looking forward to some kind of a change and more than that they were uh, happy that there was some political stability which was uh, uh, about to come because james the first was married he had kids and the english people assumed that this could perhaps promise a long term political stability and will also not lead to any kind of uh, um, overthrow of power in between or uh, lead to any kind of uh, uh, challenges for succession but however the reign was not a very smooth one as we begin to note in history later on uh, english parliament was comparatively a, a freer and a more secular kind of a space but James I was an advocate of royal absolutism and this was not taken very kindly by the uh, parliamentarians in uh, England during that time. And because of this he increasingly he uh, got into trouble with the parliament and he was uh, the parliament itself was quite self assertive during the times. And because of that there were continuous problems with the king and the uh, parliament it was an ongoing thing throughout. Uh, King uh, James the first uh, uh, rule and we also find that there were a couple of uh, very serious threats to his life uh, the, the prominent one being the gunpowder plot which was exposed and the uh, convicts were uh, caught and uh, executed as well but nevertheless there was always this uh, uh, there was always this um, threat to the stability uh, threat to the kind of uh, uh, powers that uh, James the first enjoyed because of uh, the many interventions of the parliament. And he even resorted to many drastic things like dissolving the parliament in 1611. Many of these details we shall come back to again because it becomes important to situate the emergence of the civil war in uh, England at a later point of time. And we also see that it was these many unpopular parliamentary practices of the king that eventually led England to erupt in a, uh, in a state of rebellion against Charles I his successor. So we begin to note that the seeds of this unrest and the seeds of this uh, uh, the the uh, the ongoing tussle between the monarchy and between the parliament it had uh, uh, it was uh, beginning to brew right from the time of time of uh, James the first, and he also he styled himself at, as the king of Great Britain because he was ruling over three provinces at this point of time. There was England, there was Ireland, and also Scotland. So there was uh, he styled himself as the king of Great Britain which uh, some of the parliamentarians did not take uh, uh, very kindly either. One thing which uh, proved to be quite profitable and also proved to be quite disadvantage disadvantages to King James I was his learned and scholarly nature. He was quite uh, fortunate to have received a very good education when he was in Scotland. He was uh, quite learned in Greek, uh, Latin and French and he also had uh, uh, a lot of scholarly ambitions in his mind. He was a renowned writer as well but at the same time as some historians would put it the, the kind of background that he had, the kind of education and the kind of scholarly that background that he had it aroused in him literary ambitions rarely found in princes but which also tended to make him a pedant. So this uh, had uh, led to a lot of controversies about his, uh, his powers and his uh, uh, merit as a writer and even as a uh, historian. But at the same time it is important to uh, note that uh, he had registered, he had left his mark in England as for uh, many of the contributions that he made though indirectly towards the uh, progress of literature and though it was not a, a continuation of the Elizabethan age though there was a certain kind of decline during the El Jacobian times in terms of literary arts and other kinds of uh, uh, artistic trends we do find that King James uh, leaves uh, uh, that King James left uh, an indelible mark in Engl English history. So how do we begin to talk about Jacobian age how do we classify it this was uh, the reign of James the first and all who, all, who was also James the sixth of Scotland he reigned from uh, he lived from 1566 to 1625 and we know that he rose to power in Scotland in 1567 and he becomes the king of uh, England in 1603. When we talk about the Jacobian age and its characteristics it is very in interesting to note that there were only subtle differences from the preceding Elizabethan age. We do not find any major dramatic change of moods in terms of literature or in terms of arts. In certain ways it is even a continuation from the Elizabethan period and this is also Jacobian age also falls under the period of English renaissance in that sense 
Uh, it's uh, another form of renaissance that we begin to see in the Jacobian period and some even say that it's a late uh, renaissance, it's a uh, renaissance which begins to see the decline. It's important to see how this gets uh, framed in history. If we talk about the age of renaissance in England, politically it falls into three different ages and literary uh, as well. There is this Elizabethan age from 1558 to 1603. The second phase is the Jacobian age under King James I from 1603 to 1604. The third phase is the Carolyn age under Charles I from 1625 to 1649. So, uh, the age of renaissance in, in fact spans all three different literary and political periods. And we also find that there are a lot of overlaps between these two ages Elizabethan and Jacobian. Uh, in the sense that uh, we find that William Shakespeare continues to write even during the Jacobian period and there are also significant overlaps that we find particularly in the case of uh, certain writers such as uh, Francis Bacon and Thomas Decker. It is very difficult to situate them either in the Elizabethan period or in the uh, Jacobian period, but for convenience we will be discussing um, about the works and lives of Bacon and uh, Decker during the Jacobian period and also we will begin to notice that there were a lot of uh, uh, similar overlaps and similar untidy divisions because of the uh, strange way in which uh, history and uh, uh, political history and literary history had been uh, placed simultaneously. Having noted that the Jacobian period was only a continuation of the English uh, renaissance uh, and uh, it is important to highlight that politically it had signified certain uh, differences, uh, certain uh, uh, drastic changes also as we noted earlier in terms of the shifting uh, trends within the parliament and also the union of the crowns happened, the union of the crowns of England and Scotland. And uh, there were these uh, difficult times as well with the death of, uh, with the return of the black death or the great plague at a later point. Now, we will look at the general mood in literature during the Jacobian period. Jacobian period though it was uh, generally seen as a continuation of the Elizabethan period, it was not, it was very different from the Elizabethan period. It was not a golden age in uh, literature. We witnessed more like a steady decline in literary arts and uh, uh, performances and also in the genius of the times, uh, it is uh, quite questionable as well. In, uh, if we look at the general mood, we find that it was mostly uh, uh, what dominated was a dark and questioning uh, mood and also the stability of the social order it was not taken for granted any longer, the people were continuously questioning it and we also find it getting reflected in the uh, writings of those times. And they were also preoccupied with the problem of evil, we also find it getting reflected in the uh, political trends of the time, political stability was no longer a very common thing people actually longed for it and we also found that there were a lot of uh, threats to this leading to uh, a lot of discord and evil thoughts even among the commoners. And in terms of the literary uh, art forms, we find drama do continuing to dominate the scene, but it was mostly driven to tragedy that dominates uh, uh, Jacobian England, there is also a bit of comedy, poetry and uh, prose. And we find these major figures uh, dominating the literary scene in Jacobian age, Ben Johnson, Francis Beaumont. John Fletcher, John Dunn, Francis Bacon and Robert Burton and uh, some of them uh, had uh, uh, begun to write even during the time of the Elizabethan period, but as we noted we will be talking about them in detail only uh, as part of the Jacobian period. And this is what one of the historians Hudson notes about this Jacobian uh, period. He uh, opines that Jacobian period had a very fine mix of uh, many of the uh, otherwise diverse uh, things put together. Uh, in that sense, it uh, not only had the graceful verse of Johnson and the Cavalier poets, but also the intellectual complexity of the metaphysical poetry of John Dunn. Metaphysical poetry is a school of thought that uh, we shall be coming back to take a detailed look at uh, at a later point. And uh, also this uh, period we note that though there was no towering figure like that of Shakespeare and there was no uh, towering form of genius like that of the Elizabethan uh, drama, we do find that there was a uh, a sporadic kind of literary activity and dramatic activity happening in uh, Jacobian age, but in comparison to the uh, previous age of the Elizabethan, uh, that of the Elizabethan age, it completely fades away. And we do not find the historians attributing a lot of importance to the Jacobian period. In fact, the pro prominent historian uh, Hudson, he does not even uh, devote a separate chapter for discussing Jacobian age. He just uh, uh, seamlessly transitions from. Uh, the um, Elizabethan period uh, towards the age of Milton. So, this is a kind of um, differing ways in which the Jacobian period gets situated in uh, literary histories. 
uh, but nevertheless it is important to look at it in order to uh, see the continuity which is built into this uh, various phases of renaissance. And having said that it is also important to highlight that the most monumental achievement of the Jacobian period continues to be the King James version of the Bible commissioned by King James the first and this uh, continues to be the most uh, important uh, literary work of the period and also perhaps the best contribution uh, in terms of the uh, most authentic translation of uh, Bible made ever. These were the other major literary forms that dominated uh, the scene then. Uh, in theatre we had mostly imitators of Shakespeare because of that they failed to make a mark as uh, huge as uh, it was during the Elizabethan times and uh, there is also a dominance of comedies and masks. And uh, another significant thing is that uh, at a later point we find the theatres closing down after the Puritan revolution. So, a steady decline is beginning to be noted from this period onwards. The reasons for the closure of the theatre and uh, the steady decline of drama these are things that we will come back to take a look at when we talk about the uh, Carolyn age after uh, the Jacobian age. And during this period sonnet also goes out of fashion and this is after the thriving uh, uh, cultural importance that it had during the Elizabethan period. But however sonnet continues to be used only for religious purposes especially we find uh, in John Donne's poetry and also uh, sonnet is used for political purposes for instance uh, John Milton made uh, a, a lot of use of uh, the sonnets in this regard. And there are also these newer forms of uh, um, uh, literature newer genres that begin to be uh, be, that begin to forge themselves in, uh, in Jacobian England such as heroic couplets, verse attires, essays and biographies. And we also find that there is a way in which uh, literature begins to transition towards more uh, prose forms rather than more poetic forms and the reasons for that and the ways in which this transition takes place those are some of the things that we, uh, we shall take a detailed look at in the uh, following sessions. With this we come to an end to uh, the introduction to the Jacobian age and in the next session we shall be taking a look at how drama was getting a shape during this time after Shakespeare and we shall also take a look at how certain political changes were coming into effect which eventually led to the uh, civil war in England and also we will see how uh, many uh, forms of art and many uh, forms of writing were undergoing a drastic change during this period. So, this is all we have for today's lecture, look forward to see you in the next session, thank you for listening.